Uh, hello, uh, I'm Dr. Richard Abels, um, Professor Emeritus from the United States Naval Academy. And what I'd like to talk to you about today is the reign of Athelred II, known as Athelred the Unready, and the second round of Viking Wars, the Viking Wars which resulted in the Danish conquest of England. Edgar the Peaceable, mm -hmm. who reigns from 959 until his death in 975. Edgar is called the peaceable, actually the word in Latin is pacificus, and I prefer to call him the peacekeeper. Okay. His reign is the high point. Not only do we see a kingdom of England, one which has the institutions of government, has shires, and within the shires has hundreds, and the hundreds themselves are divided into what's called tithings, uh, groups of 10 free men, all of them responsible for the good behavior of the other nine. That not only does it have this, but also Edgar dominated the Celtic princes and kings of the British Isles as well. In 973, when he had himself crowned for the second time in almost an imperial coronation at Bath, there is a story, and it's probably true, that this was celebrated by having him rowed on the Dees River by, sometimes it's called seven, other times nine British sub-kings, acknowledging his authority. Edgar's power seems to have been naval power. And Alfred's little fleet had swelled with the development of what's called ship soaks, districts that were responsible for producing royal ships. Now, Edgar's reign was peaceful because Edgar was militarily powerful, but it's a long reign. And the type of military system that I've described was extremely expensive, really expensive. So what happens if you have a long period of peace and a really expensive military system? that's no longer needed. The military system goes. Yeah. And in fact, those boroughs that were built as military centers now became commercial centers. Commercial centers don't really require defensive systems. They don't require walls. They don't require ditches and ramparts. In fact, those really interfere with commerce. And so what you had was the sliding of the defenses in order to be able to make these boroughs more accessible. And the boroughs that had been built purely as forts were abandoned and new towns were built on more commercial, commercially favorable lands. England became prosperous. England became a wealthy, wealthy country. One of the results of peace, one of the consequences of peace, was the growth of the economy. England's economy flourished in the second half of the 10th century. It began with the growth of agriculture. Every pre-modern society is essentially an agrarian society. Mm -hmm. If you don't have surplus agricultural wealth, you can't have commerce in right. non-agricultural products. You can't have the luxuries. Towns and markets are the result of the growth of agriculture and the production of surplus agricultural products. Now, how this happened in the 10th century was the breakup of very large, complex estates, royal estates and the estates of great magnets that were called multiple estates. Basically, you had a central estate, and then what you had, and it could be miles away, were smaller dependent estates that owed rents to that central estate. What happened in the 10th century were kings and the great magnates started to reward their followers by giving them those outlying estates. 
these became individual manors. And the new owners of these manors were intent upon making them as profitable as possible. The result of this and their create their intention of doing this was one, the changing of a agricultural system, the beginnings of what was going to be called the open field system, the three field system in the Midlands and East Anglia, the creation of new villages or the movement of villages and the winning over of the peasant populations to the new system by giving them things. And what they gave them basically were parish churches. England becomes now organized ecclesiastically by parishes and by mills. Virtually every stream in England was going to have a mill built on it. On the other hand, the attention of these landlords to the peasants had really negative effects on the peasants because what the landlords did was they demanded more labor service. Mm -hmm. And there was a greater, well, there there was a depression in terms of what one would call peasant freedom. The peasants themselves became a more hierarchically structured group. The poorest of the peasants, people called Yevors, were little different from slaves, and they became what later we know as serfs. Yeah. They were free in the least theory, but they were so economically dependent, they couldn't move. The landlords, on the other hand, became rich. Yeah. <laughs> and they became not only residents of the countryside, but they also built townhouses. They became connected with the towns and they became connected with what the towns could provide. And what the towns could provide was the wealth and luxury commodities that marked them as an elite. So the rich now would dress in silk. They would port silk, they would dress in silk. They also would eat food that the lower classes simply couldn't afford to eat. They would eat food that was gained through hunting, venison. Um, They would eat fish, gained through fishing. Basically, they would eat foods that required labor in order to, real labor in order to acquire them, and which the poor populations just couldn't afford. And the connection between them and these luxuries were merchants. We get a sense of what a merchant did from a, what's called Elfrich of Einstein's collo- colloquy. Elfrich of Einstein was an abbot. He was also a great literary figure in, in the late 10th and early 11th century. And in order to teach young monks Latin, what he did was he produced a colloquy. And the colloquy was a treatise on the various professions in simple language that's glossed with Old English. And among the professions is that of a merchant. And the merchant describes his trade in this in these words. I am useful to both king and elderman. The elderman is the highest of the royal officials. And to the wealthy and to all people. I sail to lands overseas and sell my goods and buy precious things which aren't produced in this country. I buy purple cloths and silks, precious jewels and gold, unusual clothes and spices, wine and oil, ivory and bronze, copper and tin, sulfur and glass, and many similar things. And all those are the things that mark the elite as an elite. So we have the elite diet, we have the elite dress, we have, and we know that the diet of the elite included things like herring, sturgeon, porpoise, ducks, crane, and swans. And we have this from archaeological remains. Right. And we have wine, always important, and white bread. 
as opposed mm -hmm. to the coarser type of bread. The elite also had elite activities, hunting and falconry. So we have this elite, wealthy nobility. We have a rich country. We have a king who's a theocratic king who takes an oath to preserve the peace of the church and the realm, to forbid theft and unrighteous things, to command justice and mercy in all judgments, the threefold oath he took after being anointed as king. What don't we have? We don't have an effective military system. Right. So that is the problem.